Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Scott Hepburn, Bjorn Andre, and Jeff Wilkes. Coming up on DTNS, the U.S. bans NVIDIA from selling chips to China. Well, sort of. Uh, is it bad to use AI to win a state fair competition? And hallelujah, Twitter launched the edit button. Hooray! This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, September 1st, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. On location, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Jane. You know, Apple might do some weird stuff with that iPhone notch next week, but guess what? We'll find out next week when they actually announced it. Until then, <laughs> here's a few things that have actually happened that you should know. The UK's Competition and Markets Authority, or CMA, has expressed concerns over Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard and will move to a phase two investigation if Microsoft is not able to answer certain questions within five working days. They get the weekend off. The $68.7 billion deal is also being looked at by the US FTC and the European Commission, as well as other regulators uh, with Saudi Arabia, the only country to approve the deal so far. The CMA is, quote, concerned that Microsoft's anticipated purchase of Activision Blizzard could substantially lessen competition in gaming consoles, multi-game subscription services, and cloud gaming services. In other words, all the game things. A report from the Wall Street Journal says that Disney's in the early stages of planning for a membership program similar to Amazon Prime. Unnamed sources told the Wall Street Journal the membership would include, quote, discounts or special perks to encourage customers to spend more on its streaming services, theme parks, resorts, and merchandise. The program would also continue a trend of customers of one Disney product getting discounts on other Disney products, like the existing perk of Disney World stays being 25% off for Disney Plus subscribers. Hmm. The company is talking about working with third parties for the program, like being able to offer discounted Disney Broadway show tickets. Disney has not yet commented on the rumored program. I mean, in the next two years, if I'm not able to click on the screen to buy a toy of the thing I'm looking at, I'll be shocked. Arm is suing Qualcomm over Nuvia's custom CPU code in a U.S. federal district court in Delaware. Arm accuses Qualcomm of breach of licenses and to fulfill obligations under those license agreements is seeking the destruction of its Nuvia CPU designs as well as compensation. Arm says Qualcomm's improper acquisition of relevant Nuvia technology in violation of Arm's standard provisions threatens to harm Arm's position in the ecosystem of Arm-based devices and embolden other companies to likewise harm Arm's reasonable business expectations in issuing its licenses. This is a weird fight, though, because Qualcomm and Arm, they, they're usually hand in hand. Uh, Qualcomm's general counsel responded, Arm's complaint ignores the fact that Qualcomm has broad, well-established license rights covering its custom-designed CPUs, and we are confident those rights will be affirmed. We'll keep you up to date if any of this really affects any of us. E-commerce company Jumia is partnering with longtime drone delivery company Zipline to launch on-demand deliveries in Ghana with plans to expand to Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire. This will particularly benefit rural areas, which make up about 27% of Jumia's orders. Zipline's drones will carry a maximum payload of 3 kilograms out of 11.8 liters. So we're talking about a limited selection of products and not full grocery orders. Zipline has operated since 2015, starting with medical deliveries in Rwanda and counts Novant Health and Walmart as clients. At IFA 2022, Lenovo announced its new line of products, the X1 Fold is a tablet that folds into a laptop configuration and now comes in a bigger version. It's got a 16-inch screen. And uh, from all the reviews, that 16-inch screen makes all the difference. They also improved the hinge, put webcams on two sides. It's shipping in November for $2,499. Looks like a solid entry. Uh, Lenovo Glasses T1 were showed off. They put two micro OLED screens in a pair of prescription glasses. Like all these things, they look like a pair of sunglasses. Uh, they connect by a wire, though, USB-C. 
PC to any Windows, Android, or Mac OS device, and you can use them on an iPhone with an adapter. No pricing on that yet, and it's going to ship to China first next year. Lenovo also updated its ThinkVision monitors, its Tab P11 Android tablets, and added a 16-inch version of the IdeaPad Flex 5i Chromebook. That one will run you 549 euros. But you didn't come here for any of that. You came here to celebrate, right, Justin? Friends, the time has come. Haters will say it's Photoshop. You don't have to like it, but you will learn to love it. Indeed, Twitter has an edit button. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. We've all waited a long time for this, and we can now rest our keyboards and revel in our victory. Wait a minute. How do you spell revel? <laughs> Doesn't matter. I can edit this later when I post about it on Twitter. Well, Almost. Twitter is doing internal testing, so you may see some edited tweets from those folks. But later in September, subscribers to Twitter's $4.99 a month blue subscription will indeed get the button. All right. So here's how it's working now in the test. Uh, for 30 minutes after you post, uh, you can edit your tweet. You have 30 minutes to edit it. Twitter says a few times in its official blog post. It didn't put an exact number on it, at least not yet. Uh, if a tweet has been edited, uh, the rest of us will all see a little pencil icon with the phrase last edited and a time and date to let you know it was edited uh, this time on this date. If you click on any of that, uh, you will be taken to an edit history so you can actually see what was changed. The original thing, was it just a typo? Did they change the meaning, etc.? cetera? Uh, Twitter talked a lot in their post about wanting to test the effects of this feature before rolling it out to more people to see if it's you know going to be misused some way they didn't anticipate. So it might end up working a little differently when it's actually rolled out to subscribers. And we don't know if it's going to roll out to non-subscribers. Twitter wrote, as part of their subscription... They, meaning the subscribers, receive early access to features and help us test them before they come to Twitter. That kind of implies that this might eventually just come to the rest of the Twitter, but they didn't say it for sure. Uh, the test will be localized to a single country at first and expand as they learn and observe how people use edit tweet. A lot of hand wringing in this post, Justin, about worrying that people are going to misuse this thing, but it's there. It's finally launching. I hope the one country that gets it before anyone is Cote d'Ivoire. I <laughs> believe that this is something that obviously has been on the the, the minds of uh, fans of Twitter, active users of Twitter for a very, very, very long time. There has to be a reason why it hasn't happened up till this point. And I think the hand wringing that you're describing is that reason people were afraid Twitter has long been been uh, not made it a secret that they were afraid of an edit button being used to change a, a a thing that is getting traction while it is getting traction and something beyond possibly more insidious than just deleting the tweet. Yeah, I I I think it is fair for Twitter to say, hey, you know what? A mistake we get uh, nailed about in, and other companies get nailed about is not preparing well enough for misuse and then having to scramble later. So we're trying to get ahead of that. I think that's smart. On the other hand, edit features aren't new. They've been around since the 90s in forums. <laughs> the dawn of the internet. Yeah. This isn't like they invented the edit and they're the first no. one to ever do this. Freaking Facebook, a, a minefield for misuse, has had an edit yeah. function for years, right? So why now? That That's really the only thing that I care about because this seemed like this has long seemed like a slam dunk feature for them. But the question for me is, if not then, then why now? And I can't help but think about the fact that the current regime of Twitter, by their own actions, doesn't want to be the current regime much longer. They want to force a, a sale to Elon Musk, and they're going to court to try to enforce that. Uh, I, I wonder if there is an element of people that are in charge now that are like, you want to know what? We, we, we want this to be on our permanent record. We want people to know that we gave Twitter the edit button. All right, so coincidence is not proof of no. core of causation. Uh, so what are the arguments against that? Uh, I can think of a couple. One is this has been a long time in the making. They, they, you don't just roll this out since Elon Musk, uh, 
uh, decided to buy the company. They've been they've been working on it for a while. Uh, so it probably predates the motivation to to rub it in Elon's eye. Uh, and product managers often want to roll out on a schedule no matter what else is going on. Uh, and and this very much feels like a product manager delivered thing where they're like rolling it out for internal testing and the messaging is being tacked on afterwards to me. So I, I would argue that there's also, if you read in the tea leaves, some evidence that this has just been around for a while. They've wanted to do it. They wanted to do it right. And Dorsey leaving, if anything, kind of times out to be the thing that allowed them to go ahead with it because he was the one always saying never you'll never get an edit button not from me not until you pry this company from my oh i'm gonna leave yeah well and and, and i guess that's the question is exactly how much of this is yeah has been in the oven i would suspect that there have been versions of twitter of an edit button on twitter who have that have been around for as long oh, as sure. twitter has yeah they've, like, they've actually like even is, admitted that yeah yeah yeah, that, that this is something that they were probably working on uh, along with core functionality to the website. Uh, and maybe it is Jack's leadership. Maybe it's other capital V, capital G, very good reasons why this has not happened. But it did happen now <laughs> and not any other time. <laughs> the one thing we do know is that it happened now. Yeah, no, is that right, it happened right. now. Is that it? Is, yeah. And, and so and, and, and by the way, I don't necessarily think that this is tied directly to elon mm. although elon has also said he was going to be the person who brought an edit button to twitter uh i do think it probably in my mind it feels like something for which was a priority for people that are in there whether or not it was something that became a priority once jack <laughs> left or is more of a priority now that's that's you know a, you know i'm sure you'd have to get a little closer to figure yeah, out yeah. the future you, motivations you you can have something in the works for a long time and there's a whole different set of hurdles you have to go over when you make it real, right? When you go from like, yes. oh, we've had this in the works to I need to publish it. So to say like, well, they've had it in the works for a long time, they could just push a button and make it live. That, that's really not how it works. On the other hand, if your entire executive team is distracted by other priorities, it sure is a lot easier to get something you want done, done, right? So yeah, quick, quick. The mods are asleep. Although according <laughs> to, uh, uh, according to some, some other information, uh, uh, you know, the admin access was plenty full. So, you know, so anybody could have just, done it at any time. So it was, yeah, just, yeah. It just sneaked it in. Uh, by the way, since Twitter seems to be rolling out features to its paid users, Facebook, uh, looks like it may want to get in on that action. The verge got a hold of a memo that says Facebook is setting up a product organization to build paid features into Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. It's called the Monetization Experiences Group, and I can't wait to see them play the forum. Uh, it'll be led by Meta's previous <laughs> head of research, Pratiti Rechuteri. And before you get too excited, Meta's VP of Monetization, John Hageman, said the company has no plans to let a paid feature disable ads in apps. I think they might go the other way. You're going to get double the ads if you pay. <laughs> if you pay, you get more ads. That's Facebook logic at work. Uh, as we enter September, we're heading back to school and wrapping up state fairs. Now, many of you may not be aware that there's a grand tradition of state fair competitions and giving out prizes. Sure, people compete on things like cookies, flowers, butter sculptures, and hogs. But there are more recently created competitions as well. Jason Allen enter to work in the digital arts, digitally manipulated photography category at the Colorado State Fair. He called his piece Theatre de Opera Special, and it won first prize, a blue ribbon for the old boy. But wait, there's more to it than that. Yeah. Alan uh, goes by Sin Carnet, like incarnate, but with a sin, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. on the Discord Edgy. for Mid Journey. Mid Journey is not like Middle Earth so much as like Dolly. It's one of the many text to image generators out there. It's particularly good at mimicking art styles. You put in some text, it spits out images based on your text that are very arty. Uh, Alan says he crafted a special prompt, as you do, and then created hundreds of images from it. He then upscaled them with Gigapixel AI and printed three of them on a canvas and entered them into the fair, and one of them won. He got a blue ribbon. And then people got real angry with him. Justin, why was that? 
Oh, like so many John Henrys and Berets being mad in an artistic inky poo. <laughs> Some people think that he deceived the judges. In his description of the art, he says he created it using Midjourney, although admittedly he did not explain what Midjourney was to those who weren't hip. Allen says he told people at the show that it was, quote, digital art created using AI tools, end quote, and that people don't need to explain Adobe Illustrator, why should he have to explain Midjourney? But what do the rules say? Well, they say that an entrance should be an, quote, artistic practice that uses digital technology as part of the creative or presentation process, end quote. And Alan says that his own Photoshop editing constituted about 10% of the work. Okay, so maybe it technically is within the rules, but folks still argue that if the judges had known this was generated by an AI, Alan wouldn't have won. But none of those people or anyone else has filed a grievance with the fair about the win. Uh, Tom, what what is the chain of custody here for legal battles when it comes to to the fair? Is there a fair <laughs> Supreme Court? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and and two, do you think this guy's a dirty, rotten cheat? I, uh, I I am not as steeped in the uh, in the appeals process of the Colorado State Fair as perhaps I should be. But but from what I have come to understand, uh, anybody can file a grievance uh, over an award. You know, if if that that uh, horrible thief Patty uh, stole your uh, chocolate crinkles recipe and won a blue ribbon, you can file a grievance and, and the fair board will uh, consider it and look it over. And nobody's done that. So uh, nobody's taken away his blue ribbon. They're just mad at him on the internet, which reduces my taking you seriously quite a bit, right? It's like, you just want to complain. This isn't hurting anybody. And in fact, what Alan said he's doing here is trying to raise awareness of what AI can do and how it interrelates with art and get a conversation started about using AI for art and what its role is in this. I would sweep away a lot of the objections to this pretty immediately by pointing out he didn't just say AI, make me a prize winning art uh, he he crafted a piece of text which anybody who's tried these things knows you have to, that's a skill to create the text trickier, that is going to create the thing than, you want trickier right? than you might think it is yeah. trickier than you might think for sure there's a skill to figuring out how to get it to kick out what you want. Then he went in and did some work himself. Granted, he says it's only about 10%, but he did some touching up. He used Photoshop. So he put his touch on this. The question is, should he have disclosed that he didn't do 90% of the work? Uh, and would that may have made a difference to the judges? I, I feel like, you know what? If the Colorado State Fair uh, wants to change the rules next time, now that this is a thing, then they should. But as it stands now, he played by the rules. He deserves his blue ribbon. With all due respect to the Colorado State Fair and state fairs in general, this does not particularly seem like it was the highest trafficked contest i don't i don't i don't know uh, and and i've been to plenty of state fairs the texas state fair the new york state fair uh which are very competitive especially when it comes to livestock and and the fun things like butter sculptures and stuff like that i don't know exactly how much traffic uh, what is effectively a state-sponsored version of photoshop friday would have necessarily gotten while people are stuffing their faces with deep fried twinkies that being said he was up front and it just so happens that there are AI tools that that might be more uh, powerful than some would would want. And if the judges next year want to make this more of a Photoshop specific competition, then they should make rules to guard against it. He didn't lie about it. He didn't say he did everything. He explained the 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 uh, program that he used. Was he uh, uh, going to the edge of the law? Maybe you can sure. make that argument, but he won. He yeah. used technology and he won. God bless him. He followed the community standards, which is you just say what the, the thing is. And and he says, I didn't hide it. I told people when they asked it was AI. Uh, I, I think there is a valid argument that someone going into Illustrator and, and working on all of a, a thing is a different skill than using the AI to generate an image, selecting the image you think is going to win, and then touching it up. They're both skills. Yeah. They are different skills. And so, yeah, maybe they should have a separate category in the future uh, for this. I, I think that's worth it. But I also don't think this is the same thing as saying he cheated by getting the computer to make it. I don't think it's, I don't think it's that simple.
I mean, a- any more than somebody would say that exact same argument about Illustrator 15 years ago. Yeah, right. Exactly. Or or somebody would say, you know, accuse someone of having their mom bake the chocolate crinkles and giving them a, a red ribbon instead of a blue ribbon at the 4-H county fair sometime this in the feels, past. This possibly. feels like a like a repressed uh, conflict of, of um, No, it's just a it's just a theoretical theoretical example. A theoretical one. Yeah. Hey folks, do you think this was outrageous? Do you think AI should be banned from state fairs? Uh, or do you have like uh, a take on this that we, we could read on the show? One way to let us know is in our subreddit. This story is there, as are many others. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. The U.S. Commerce Department put in place new rules on August 26th that require a license if you want to export high-end machine learning chips that meet or exceed a certain performance threshold. So it's not a list of chips. It says if they perform at this rate or better, you got to get a license or you can't sell them to Russia, Hong Kong, or China. The rules are meant to address the risk that such chips might have a military end use or a military end user in China or Russia. Now, the U.S. has not made the details of the restrictions public, but NVIDIA mentioned them when it filed an update in its earnings projection with the U.S. SEC. The licensing requirements apply to NVIDIA's two-year-old A100s and forthcoming H100 GPUs and AMD's MI250 accelerator chips. These chips are used in data centers to train machine learning algorithms. For example, The Verge notes that Meta uses a few thousand A100 chips in its AI researcher supercluster. In its filing, NVIDIA says that it thinks about $400 million of its expected $5.9 billion in sales in Q3, quote, may be subject to the new license requirement. Now, that doesn't mean they'll lose all of it. That means they'll have to convince people to take alternative chips or get a license. Uh, NVIDIA said it may seek a license to sell the chips in some cases. And in fact, on Thursday, it received authorization to export A100s through March 1st in order to provide support to U.S. customers that are operating in China. It also got approvals to make sure its development of the H100 is not affected. There was some concern that some of the R&D NVIDIA does in China might stop them from developing it. They've gotten that cleared up. Uh, As far as Russia goes, NVIDIA wasn't selling chips in Russia, neither was AMD. So it's mostly about China here. So the Wall Street Journal notes that Alibaba, which operates China's largest cloud service in Tencent, which also sells cloud services and is one of China's largest video and social media companies, both are big customers of NVIDIA and have bought A100s in the past. It's unclear how much of the business involves the two restricted NVIDIA chips. Chinese companies may change suppliers to companies located in Europe and Israel. So on the one hand, uh, but we can throw Baidu in there too. They, they buy a lot of these things as well. Uh, on the one hand, I, I think a lot of people overreacted to this headline thinking, oh, NVIDIA has been banned from selling GPUs to China. Uh, that's really going to hurt the bottom line. And if that were true, uh, it really would hurt their bottom line. They can still sell <laughs> lots of GPUs to China. Uh, yes. they, they are only restricted from selling two types that are used for data centers. Now, on the other hand, Uh, GPU sales for consumers are cooling off, Uh, hence the ability for you to actually go buy a GPU uh, at retail list, sometimes even cheaper, as we've talked about on the show. So it is data centers where NVIDIA is getting its rosiest economic forecasts, uh, at least for the time being. So hitting them in the data center part of their revenue in China, which is a huge place for data centers, uh, is 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 not great, but it's 400 million of 5.6 billion and not all 400 million. Uh, I think NVIDIA will be fine. They're not going to like this. They took a little bit of a stock hit, which I think is reasonable and uh, and they'll operate. What I think is more interesting is this cross administration approach by the United States that's not associated with any one president uh, of slowly eating away at China's ability to play in tech. 
Uh, there's been a lot of, of of rhetoric around AI in particular, which is what this one is focused at. Uh, but they're also talking about restricting FinFET construction uh, materials so that they can't make some of the more advanced chips in China. And you're seeing a lot of companies, we've talked about it here on the show, moving their operations to Vietnam, moving their operations to India, even Brazil, Mexico, the United States, and other places. Uh, so it is, it is a consistent drumbeat of pressure to reduce reliance on China as a place that makes tech. And I think the fact that we went through the supply chain stuff that we saw uh, over the last few years is part of it. There certainly has been a bipartisan move to distance uh, the United States away from China. At the very least, you could say without a shadow of a doubt that the world of endless Chinese expansion and optimism in terms of the United States is over. Uh, whether or not we get back, whether or not there's a deal to be struck, whether or not uh, uh, China will on some level be less of a, uh, a, a possible military conflict in the future. I'm not rosy on that, <laughs> but you never know. In the meantime, I think you're going to see more little things like this because the United States and China have been unable to come to a trade agreement where a lot of this stuff would otherwise be part of a large bargain. Right. Like this, this is a piecemeal part yeah, yeah. of what in, in other situations, if you're talking about the EU, if you're talking about uh, the United Kingdom or, or certain countries in South America or India, it would be part of a larger trade deal. This yeah. isn't. And it's largely because China has not been able to play well with the United States. This I, I, I don't think it would be reasonable to separate this from the larger world conflict between China and the United States about so many different things. Uh, it is certainly part of that. But it is also and I, maybe even majority focused on supply chain diversity, uh, on the idea of bringing production under U.S. control uh, or Second to that, at least diversifying the supply chain so that if Vietnam is the next one or, or India is the next one that cracks down on stuff, you're not losing or you're not seeing your supply chain threatened by one particular regime. Uh, and I, I think we'll see more of that over the next couple uh, one of years. Last, one last thought on this. I do think that it is realistic to say that if the United States puts these roadblocks in China's way, especially for gigantic companies like those are in China, that... If they have, if if you feel a little pain, if you don't like that rock in your shoe, you can always come and start talking to us about what we would like in return. If you would like more of these data center chips, yeah, uh, that leads to a wider conversation of of what the U.S. is going to ask for it has nothing to do with tech, and China's not want to give it to them, will they? You never know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let's talk space then. Absolutely. Back in May, NASA announced that Voyager 1 space probe was sending jumbled or inaccurate telemetry back to Earth, even though the probe itself didn't seem to be failing. Now, NASA says that the Voyager team has solved the issue. Here's what happened. The probe's Attitude Articulation and Control System, AACS, was sending back information using an onboard computer that hadn't worked for years, corrupting the data at the source. Voyager project manager, manager Suzanne Dodd explains that the team commanded the AACS to send its data through the probe's working computer again and bypass known faulty issues on the spacecraft. Voyager 1 has been operational for almost 45 years, and NASA thinks it should be able to run at least one more science instrument until 2025 before it drifts out of our solar system and down that cosmic dusty trail top. To become V'ger someday. Uh, yeah, I, I looked at this and I was like, well, that's weird. I wonder how it started routing through the old computer system that they had stopped it from routing through. I wonder what caused that. And then I remembered, well, because it's uh, so hundreds of light years away, not, maybe not hundreds, but it's because it's so darn far away, you know? Yeah. A micrometeorite just jostled it and it, it you know, it, it clicked back to an old piece of program. A neutrino uh, went through. Who knows? The fact that it's <laughs> operating at all is incredible. Amazing. Amazing. And, yeah. No, and even more incredible tech. is that they could push an update and be like, no, go back to the other thing. And it's like, oh, OK, I'm working again. Here we go. Uh, yeah, that's it's truly amazing. Some of it is uh, the simplicity of the system. You're right. I'm sure that there are many 45 year olds listening to this right now, wishing that their hardware was as stout as Voyager's. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, all right, let's check out the mailbag. I thought I, uh, uh, Mike thought I should say Mike in far too hot Dubai. Man, I feel you, Mike. Uh, Mike thought. I would write in with a quick review for a gadget I didn't expect to love so much. I love this, Mike. Thank you for writing in with a little review. Let's see what Mike is living with. Uh, I have been an e-ink Kindle user for eight or nine years now. There was nothing wrong with my old Kindle, but I've been tempted by an upgrade for some time as part of my quest to have everything be USB-C. Uh, Amazon had a sale that packaged the Kindle Paperwhite Signature Edition, a case, and wireless charger for $189. So I figured I'd sell my old one and upgrade. My God, the updated e-ink interface is noticeably better. It still has a slight lag over a tablet, but it's close to instant. The ambient light sensor is great, along with the ability to control the warmth of the backlight, since 90% of my reading is at night anyhow. And on top of all of this, it's water resistant. So I'll feel a little more confident taking it to the pool or the beach. I feel a little guilty splurging on this, but now that I have it, totally worth it. Thank you, Mike. Uh, did Paperwhite. You have a Paperwhite, don't you? I do. I do. Uh, uh, I wish I used it more, but uh, uh, I've, it is certainly not the fault of the device. <laughs> it is the fault of my own uh, attention deficit. Well, uh, if, if you've got little ones like that, and that was the perfect length, uh, Mike is a, a standard setter uh, for that. We'd, we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on, on the stuff you've been getting. Uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thank you, Justin Robert Young, for being with us. Uh, tell the fine folks what they can hear from you elsewhere these days. Well, of course, we are less than 10 weeks away from the midterm elections, and that means we are up to our elbows in polls. Yep, this is when the polls are out. This is when we can tell who's charging ahead, flagging behind, and everything in between. Messaging, campaigns, commercials, there's only one place that you can follow all of it, and that is the Politics, Politics, Politics program. Head on over there, anywhere that you find your podcast. In fact, the place that you're listening to this can also find you there. Oh, good point. Yeah. The place where you're finding the only independent daily technology news show is the place you go. can find the only independent traveling political reporter, my friends. Yep. Go it. do it now. Uh, and the fact that we're able to be independent and continue to do this for, for almost 10 years now is because of our bosses. Uh, and we've got brand new ones. So all, all the bosses, gather around, everybody. Uh, welcome in Alan, Michael, and Reginald. Well done. Alan, Michael, and Reginald, our brand new bosses, just started backing us on Patreon, and we're very happy to have them. Uh, if you'd like to feel that warmth that Alan, Michael, and Reginald are, well, just sign on up, patreon.com slash DTNS. In fact, patrons, stick around. We've got the extended show coming. Good day. Internet starts momentarily. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>